Thank you very much, Runus. Uh, Ambassador McCarthy, my good friend and uh, uh, compatriot for many years, other ambassadors. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to be here. I have to sort of start out by recalling my last visit uh, to Vilnius when I was Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for uh, European Affairs. I was responsible for the U.S.-European Union relationship. And uh, in 2004, when the large uh, enlargement of the European Union was about to take place, we decided that we should visit all of the uh, 10 new member states of the European Union. And the slogan for the trip was, more EU equals more US. And the argument that we made, or we, the, the point that we made as we went around, uh, that we had a long-standing bilateral relationship with Lithuania from independence, uh, and a long commitment to the independence of Lithuania uh, and the other uh, Baltic states uh, during the Cold War. And um, uh, we wanted to assure uh, uh, Lithuania that uh, joining the EU made uh, our bilateral relationship more important uh, rather than less. It wasn't a hard message to take, uh, but I, uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be back uh, here in Vilnius. Um, I thought I would start with just a very brief word about the RAND Corporation, just to explain uh, what I do there and how it, uh, it the relationship uh, that it has to TTIP. And uh, not many people quite understand RAND. It, it is a, uh, a, an institution for more than 60 years that does objective evidence-based research uh, on public policy issues. And we mainly work for governments and foundations. RAND Europe uh, is a subsidiary of RAND and in my area of the, of the uh, uh, institution and it has offices in Cambridge and Brussels um, working on European uh, uh, public policy issues uh, such as health, transport, criminal justice, innovation, education and other social policy problems. We don't do private benefit consulting, so we, we don't, we're not like a McKinsey or a Booz Allen or these kinds of things. And we don't work f for uh, companies, uh, don't represent uh, companies or governments uh, as a sort of a lobbyist. What we try to do is just do objective uh, uh, evidence-based research on public policy issues. That, so in that context, we, I wanted to be clear sort of declaration of interest. We don't have any ongoing research on TTIP. This is kind of in my personal capacity of hearkening back to my time in, in government. But I've long been a, a supporter uh, of the idea of such a negotiation and I'm absolutely delighted to see it go forward uh, as we'll, uh, uh, we'll talk about. So let me start my talk by, with my conclusion. It's simple. I, it's my conviction that the Transatlantic Trade and Investment uh, Partnership, or the TTIP, is the most important U.S.-European economic initiative since the Marshall Plan. Uh, and I think, as I'll try and explain, it is particularly important here in the Baltics. Why? Well, several reasons. First, it will complement NATO. It's amazing that the United States and Europe, partners in security, have deep trade and investment agreements with countries around the world, but not with each other. Our security relationship should be complemented by a strong economic relationship. Two, I think a TTIP will accelerate economic growth, especially in Europe, without impacting government deficits. Americans are very concerned about anemic economic growth in Europe. It's a threat to vitality and social stability, and a threat to the United States and the global economy too. And while we're growing, we could always do better, and a little stimulus from a TTIP wouldn't hurt that either. So three, and as I will discuss in, a, in detail a little bit later, I think a TTIP can democratize US-European trade. We talked about this a little bit uh, before with Kurt. Right now, because trade and investment flows face such regulatory burdens and tariff barriers, the transatlantic economic relationship is dominated by large firms. In fact, 50% of trade uh, between the United States and Europe is actually intercorporate trade. A TTIP, by making it easier for small and medium-sized firms to serve customers across the Atlantic, will bring in a larger number of stakeholders into the economic relationship, bolstering support 
for an interest in the broader transatlantic relationship. Four, a TTIP can help Europe with its internal crisis of confidence in EU institutions. This is an agreement that can best be secured by the European Commission and is, will constitute a very strong benefit to member states from being part of the Union. I think this can help in Britain and elsewhere where Euroscepticism is strong and growing, demonstrates the importance of the EU and working together in it uh, in the broader global environment. So the, tra the advantages of a transatlantic free trade agreement are, of course, so obvious that the idea of such an agreement has been seriously considered before. In 1995, the EU of the 15 and the United States actually came close to beginning such a negotiation. At the time, it was notable that the advocates were led by two prominent foreign ministers, Klaus Kinkel of Germany and Malcolm Rifkin of Britain. Kinkel and Rifkin understood that after the fall of the wall, transatlantic free trade would be a natural counterpart to the outward expansion of the EU and NATO. Unfortunately, trade policy concerns doomed the 1995 effort. It was too close to the 1994 creation of the World Trade Organization. The US and Europe were both interested in keeping the rest of the world engaged in trade liberalization, and some sectors like agriculture were just absorbing the subsidy cuts and other market changes that came with the Uruguay Round. A transatlantic free trade agreement in the 1990s seemed to be too much more trade liberalization too soon. In the intervening 20 years, however, a lot has changed. Our agriculture sectors have become stronger and more export oriented. Over a decade of our effort still didn't convince big emerging markets to lower their trade barriers in the WTO, but you can't say that we didn't try. China and Russia joined the WTO, but both have not exactly embraced its rules. In the same period of time, we negotiated uh, free trade agreements with many Latin American countries, Korea, Australia, Singapore, and began talks on a broader trans-Pacific partnership with other countries in Asia notably including Japan. The EU, uh, for its part, has negotiated trade agreements with many of its neighbors, famously enough, including Ukraine, and with Canada and Mexico, too. And the global recession of 2008-2009 made it clear that uh, the stimulus and growth from trade liberalization could be really very helpful. So why not uh, uh, look at a, a transatlantic uh, economic partnership of the kind that we are doing. And so at Germany's urging, the US and the, uh, and the EU in 2011 began a trade liberalizing effort, a new trade liberalizing effort, but with very careful preparation. A high level working group spent over a year examining the economics and the politics, publishing their full report to the leaders at the end of 2012. President Obama committed to the negotiation in his 2013 State of the Union speech, and by summer, the European Union's Council similarly agreed to go forward and adopted a formal mandate to begin the negotiation of a TTIP. And as we learned this morning, the negotiators have been hard at work uh, since the summer of 2013 and may complete their work in 2015. So what would a TTIP look like? The shor short answer, is that it would have to be a modern trade and investment agreement, much like the EU itself has become uh, over the years since the Treaty of Rome. This means that a TTIP uh, would need to eliminate all or nearly all tariffs on goods traded across the Atlantic. And while tariff lo levels are not high now, the trade weighted average of under 5%, these taxes on imports, burden exporters, are the cause themselves of red tape. And on some products, such as uh, textiles, apparel, and footwear, U.S. tariffs are actually quite high. A TTIP would also contain rules on regulatory barriers to trade that might uh, many consider to be the most serious barriers. Uh, the U.S. and the EU both have high levels of protection of health and safety, including food safety, but idiosyncratic differences in how we do it unnecessarily restrict trade. The agreement would set rules on how uh, future regulations would be made more compatible and transparent and would include an early harvest of harmonized regulations, like on automobiles that could go into effect with the adoption of the TTIP. 
A TTIP would also include obligations for fair and equal treatment of U.S. investors in the EU and EU investors into the U.S. TTIP would remove many, if not most, obstacles to companies offering services across the Atlantic or establishing service-related businesses. A quirk of our regulatory regime means that uh, exports of U.S. origin LNG would get automatic approval from the U.S. government, as, uh, as Kurt mentioned as well. And that would help uh, with uh, supplies to uh, uh, Lithuania's new floating LNG regasification terminal. Uh, and TTIP would also substantially expand opportunities for companies based on the other side of the Atlantic to provide goods and services to governments on an equal footing with local uh, firms. So it's a big deal. The IFO Institute, in a uh, study commissioned by the Berelsmann Foundation, found, in fact, that real per, uh, uh, income per capita in the EU should increase by about 5% with the implementation of a TTIP. And this is a quote from the Berelsmann release. It, they said, quote, EU member states that would profit more than average uh, from a <coughs> far-reaching liberalization of trade include the small export-oriented economies, such as the Baltic states. The Center for the uh, Economic Policy Research in London estimated that a TTIP would boost EU production by 119 billion euros, and better yet, put 500, an average of 545 more euros a year in the pocket of every European. And all that without aggravating government deficits. So if it's such an important groundbreaking agreement that will benefit both sides, why isn't it done already? Why is anyone ever worried about it? Well, any enterprise of this scale, it ta as with any enterprise of this scale, it takes time to work through all the issues and build consensus among the many interest groups concerned. The negotiators have been careful to consult with civil society farmers and businessmen, and as they work through the complexities of fashioning an agreement with so many specific provisions. So in that context, uh, there are a number of issues that have been raised here in Europe that I'd like to take on uh, directly because I think they, in many respects, reflect misconceptions and anxieties rather than economic or political analysis. So let me start with transparency. Uh, some civil society groups are criticizing the, the negotiations as purportedly secretive and call for the negotiating text to be published for all to see and comment on. Actually, this is the most transparent trade and investment uh, uh, negotiating process in history. As I mentioned earlier, the high-level working group deliberated for over a year on the merits of TTIP and consulted widely and published their conclusions and recommendations for all to see. Uh, as Kurt said, the chief negotiators uh, meet uh, before, during, and after every uh, negotiating session with the uh, stakeholders. And when it's all done, and I think this is the most important thing to remember, when it's all done, the full text of the agreement, all the annexes, all the understandings and protocols of the agreement itself will be public and, uh, and, and fully available for everyone to look at, analyze, and conclude, make their own conclusions as to whether this is in the interests of, uh, of one side or the other. And nothing takes effect until it is approved by uh, the European Parliament and the U.S. Congress um, uh, with, with a full debate. And the best way to judge a trade agreement is as a whole. When I was a negotiator on our NAFTA negotiating team, the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement, uh, I remember at one point complaining to one of my fellow negotiators about how come all we hear is criticism of the NAFTA. No one actually stands up for it. Uh, and uh, my colleague, who was older and wiser than I at the time, told me the cardinal rule of trade talks, which is that no one supports a negotiation until it's done. And it makes sense, if you think about it. Even if someone expects to gain, uh, the, they keep the pressure on until the deal is completed, since the stakeholders know that, uh, <coughs> that they might get still better benefits uh, in the agreement, and they worry about if they let up the pressure on the negotiators, maybe their sector get traded off for somebody else. But when judged as a whole, I think that the, uh, the TTIP will be uh, seen as benefiting both the EU and the United States, or it won't get done. 
So the cry transparency uh, uh, as an argument is mainly used by people who are against the very idea of a TTIP and want access to the negotiating proposals to kill it now or to use to kill it later, since in a negotiation no one ever gets uh, all that they ask for. So you may have also heard some uh, uh, groups raising concern uh, about uh, investor state dispute settlement, which we talked about this morning. And uh, <clears throat> this has to do with obviously the enforcement of the obligations of US and, uh, that U the US and EU member states may adopt as part of the negotiations to treat investors equally. Actually, I haven't seen any criticism of the idea of such obligations. It's only the mechanism for uh, allowing investors to raise concerns about the negotiations themselves. Uh, I think uh, Kurt really dealt with this very well, but let me just say uh, from my own standpoint, um, uh, the, the, the history of, of ISDS provisions has been that they are really very seldom used. Uh, they, uh, they exist in order to give investors confidence, and they exist because they are needed in some developing country markets where uh, the practice of discriminating against uh, and retaliating against foreigners is actually quite pronounced. But it's very hard to imagine a situation in which we can insist upon such provisions in uh, uh, agreements with other countries if we're not willing to accept it between the two of us. Uh, and uh, as I think, uh, as I recall, Kurt also mentioned, I've done a lot of discussions of this in the last couple of days, so I'm trying to decipher wh when he said what. But um, uh, we have ISDS provisions in our bilateral investment treaty with Lithuania. Uh, and we have had them for 16 years. Uh, and in fact, no investor has raised a ISDS uh, issue with uh, Lithuania, and that's pretty much as I would expect, given uh, Lithuania's respect for the rule of law. Uh, and uh, as we mentioned earlier this morning, in 30 years, the United States uh, has had only 17 cases in which uh, uh, investors have raised ISDS complaints against us, and uh, the United States government has prevailed uh, in the view of the arbitrators in all of these cases. Um, so let me talk a little bit about the regulatory aspects of a TTIP. Uh, economic studies uh, of transatlantic trade make it clear that the benefits uh, of the uh, agreement, the economic benefits of the agreement, there are some from the tariff elimination, but much more importantly, uh, is the, is the uh, regulatory, uh, addressing the unnecessary regulatory barriers to trade. And these are unnecessary duplicative testing requirements, food safety rules that are not based on scientific research, picky differences in automobile standards. Um, and uh, these are obviously particularly burdensome for small and medium-sized enterprises. And so, uh, as I mentioned <coughs> earlier, the uh, uh, the agreement would likely set rules for to ensure the compatibility of U.S. and European uh, regulatory provisions and may include an early harvest of specific re regulations that would be harmonized with entry into force of the agreement. But uh, you often hear the idea that somehow uh, European high levels of uh, risk and uh, high levels of precaution and uh, protection of uh, health and safety would be put at risk by uh, uh, an agreement with the United States where uh, it is alleged uh, we are fast and loose with such uh, obligations. But the fact is this is just another one of these kind of scare stories or myths that's out there without much evidence behind it. Um, a study released this summer by the Jacques Delors Institute, also known as Notre Europe, in, um, in, uh, in Paris, carefully documented uh, a randomized sample of 100 risks out of a total uh, of more than 2,000 risks that are regulated uh, for uh, in Europe and the United States. And they found that despite all the rhetoric, Europe uh, uh, adopted a so-called precautionary uh, regulatory, a more precautionary regulatory approach than the United States in 31 cases 
but that the U.S. adopted a more precautionary uh, approach than Europe in 36 cases. And in 21 cases, the researchers found that the U.S. and EU approaches were essentially equal in terms of risk precaution. Now, I've been working on Europe for over 30 years and traveling uh, in this continent for well over 50. And we all know instinctively that the U.S. and the European Union have in place the highest levels of protection for health and safety, uh, even though there are some differences in the way we do it on the margins. When visiting America, Europeans feel safe on our roads and feel safe eating our food. That will be equally true when a TTIP is completed, except that we'll have more money in our pockets to use. Um, there are many other issues to be negotiated, of course. At the end of the day, to reap the full benefits of this hugely significant initiative, um, we have to have a, a comprehensive agreement that, uh, that eliminates all tariffs and most other barriers to trade and investment. But it's very doable. Now, I just want to take a couple more minutes before finishing uh, to specifically talk about this democratization uh, effect of the TTIP. Uh, because the, the, uh, uh, I think it is the biggest uh, potential effect. Uh, the reason is obvious. It's uh, th that uh, the reason that large companies dominate uh, trade and investment across the Atlantic now is obvious because it takes it's expensive to develop uh, markets far away, design and package your products for those buyers, and to deal with customs and shipping formalities. But the market is already changing. The internet means that small companies with quality par products can market and sell their innovative products to distant consumers, something that retailer, retailing experts are calling a paradigm shift. And if, as a result of the TTIP, regulatory tariff and paperwork burdens can fall away, small companies on both sides of the Atlantic can benefit greatly. Think about it. Uh, Custom-made shoes from Milan delivered overnight to San Francisco, gourmet sausages from Dusseldorf sold in Houston, real maple syrup from Vermont offered in Amsterdam. What will Lithuanian companies sell? I was delighted to hear from Kurt that a number of companies are already thinking about the uh, opportunities. So I think that this change in and of itself will democratize the uh, nature of the transatlantic trade relationship, giving more companies, more workers, a stake in the relationship. And that's all for the better. So once in a generation, we get an opportunity to bring off such an agreement that will reinforce the strong European-American security relationship. This agreement will bring economic opportunity and faster growth to our peoples, reinforce the leadership of the United States and the European Union in the global economy, and send a message to Russia, Asia, and the rest of the world that the Atlantic relationship is strong and unbreakable. Or, as former Supreme Allied Commander Jim Stavridis argued just last week, and I quote, a negotiated and eventually ratified TTIP would be a powerful signal to Putin's Russia that Europe and the United States stand together in all dimensions, values, politics, security, and trade. And if Putin hates it, a TTIP probably makes sense, close quote. So these are all the reasons why Lithuanians and other Baltics should really strongly support a TTIP agreement and push for its early adoption. So with that, I'm, I'll finish and take questions.